All right. Well, let me introduce Ray. Uh, firstly, Ray is from Indiana and earned a Bachelor of Science degree in wildlife biology from Purdue University in 1974. Much of his life's work has been as a tree farmer, and he has done timber management and hardwood plantation management work in cooperation with other tree farmers in Southern Indiana. In retirement, Ray is making a huge impact as the administrator of the very popular Facebook page, Trees from Seed, which serves as a resource and advice column for growing, protecting, and caring for native woody plants by direct seeding. This includes everything from growing a single shade tree in the front yard from an acorn, as he'll be talking about how to do that tonight, to reforesting abandoned crop fields and idle land by direct seeding. I'm very happy to turn it over to my friend, Ray Major. Well, thank you, Bill. What a pleasure to be here. Uh, Bill and I are neighbors and it's uh, it's very nice that uh, we, we see each other quite frequently. Uh, so this evening, I'm here to talk about growing trees from seed. Uh, so October, we had to think up some kind of name for it. And so we did, but September and October are when uh, the oaks produce uh, produce their seed almost entirely by by the first of November. Most of the acorns are gone. Um, so here's our here's our first screen. Can I see the second one? Here we go. Uh, trees from seed is a page essentially to help landowners and homeowners grow trees directly in the soil from seed at no cost and with minimal labor. It's customary uh, for most of us to think of growing plants in pots. But in fact, and especially with the oaks, uh, this is a difficult matter. Uh, when you put an acorn in a pot, in a small pot and start it growing, it starts to grow, it's going to produce, uh, in the case of white oaks, over the course of the winter, it's going to produce a, a root that might be a foot or more long before you ever see a shoot at all. You won't, you won't see a shoot. The, the shoot comes up in the spring, but they germinate in the fall and produce immense roots. And so growing them in pots is problematic. They become root bound. Uh, so the 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 the, uh, the comparison is like a tiger in a cage. The the little acorn grows, the root grows, and it grows round and round the pot and becomes root bound. And trees that are planted root bound uh, generally have a lifetime of problems. They don't they don't live long. They don't grow fast. They generally are unhealthy. So. So the analogy to a tiger in a cage. Let us let's examine in the next screen uh, the the two groups of oaks that we're concerned with. There are 450 species of oaks in the world, and they fall into uh, five different subgenera. In North America, we're generally, con or at least in the eastern states here, we're com concerned with two of those groups, which uh, we should call the red oaks and the white oaks. I live in Southern Indiana. There are 19 native species of, of oaks here. Generally, as you go south and east, the, the states in the southeast have more. I think that uh, Georgia has 54 species of oaks. That reflects perhaps the, the fact that they have uh, almost tropical coastal plains to mountains. And so there are many more species. There are, there are two distinctions to make that are extraordinarily important of, among these two groups. The red oaks produce their seed over the course of two seasons. That is to say, they bloom and uh, the little seed is formed and it stays on a tree for the whole first summer and over the winter and does not ripen until the end of the second summer. The white oaks, by contrast, bloom in the spring and uh, the acorn matures in the fall. 
And, and the other distinction in their seeds is most important. And that is to say the red oaks are profoundly dormant. They have to go through a process called stratification or overwintering and they germinate and produce a root and a shoot in the spring. The white oaks, as some of you may know, begin to germinate as soon as they fall from the tree in the autumn and they find moisture. So you will see uh, acorns of the various white oak species lying on the ground and you'll see that they've sprouted little roots. That's important. The white oaks generally uh, produce their acorns a little earlier in the season. Uh, the white oaks begin to begin to actually ripen in from mid-September till the middle of October, and the red oaks ripen later as a general rule. So if you want to grow uh, members of this white oak group, uh, they need to be gathered quickly and they need to be planted uh, in the fall, you cannot hold them over. They're, they're very, they're almost impossible. If you uh, put them in dry storage, for instance, put them in a in a, a jar and stick them on the shelf in your kitchen, they will dry out and they will die when they reach a certain, uh, uh, when the, the, the moisture in the oak, in the acorn reaches a certain level, the embryo simply dies and they can't be revived. They have to be kept moist and planted in the fall. The red oaks are dormant. They need to undergo uh, the winter, essentially. Uh, you know the term stratification, perhaps. Stratification is uh, simply the process of overwintering in the absence of rodents. That is to say, we can uh, mimic the process of winter, but we can do so while protecting the acorns from squirrels and other rodents. And then when they have undergone the process of stratification, they're ready to plant in the springtime. If they're stored warm and dry, they simply remain dormant and they oh, gradually lose viability. Uh, a matter that many folks are concerned about is nativeness. And we think of plants in terms of their nativeness to a state. Uh, with the oaks and with many other trees, the concept of, of site suitability is also important. Uh, some of the oaks are suitable for many kinds of soils and site types, and some of them are very site specific. Um, oh, I'm sorry, the questions are there below, but Deb, you will you will uh, come in when we have a question that's pertinent to the moment, of course. Uh, I think there was a a question there about a dwarf chinkapin oak that went past though, and. Uh, it's quite possible to grow it. It's it's not so common here in Indiana, and I have little experience with it. But dwarf chinkapin oak is one of the white oaks, and therefore, if you have acorns for it, they should be planted in the fall and protected from rodents. Let's go to the next screen, if we may. Uh, we could we could if we could uh, if there are questions about this list of the oak species, perhaps we should go back to that one. And if there are questions regarding that, or if you live in another state and you have species of oaks that we don't have here in Indiana, um, I'll, I can certainly take questions about them, about their, their native ranges and their site suitabilities and soil preferences and so forth at, at this point. If, if not, we'll we can continue. Um, so let's let's go to the next one, and we will talk about uh, seed collection. Now, what we have here is the general guidelines for. Oh, here we go. Here's here is a question about the oak groups. Are all oaks either red or white? 
we can do the questions that way, Deb, or if you want to, to chime in and ask the question verbally, you can do so. Uh, yeah. Maybe, uh, are, are you there, right. Deb? Great. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, Ray, I'd like you to stay focused on your presentation and then uh, I can at certain times pause you and go through a couple questions. Okay, I apologize. I saw that the questions appear at the bottom of the screen, but I'll wait till you prompt me. That's fine. Is that what you mean? Right. You should probably eliminate that. So you, yes. Why don't you close the chat box so you can focus on the presentation? Oh, right. Yeah, I don't that see the chat box. Good... But no matter. Yes, ma'am. We'll do it that way. Okay, I have. I've done so. Okay, you bet. All right. So, thank you. Um, All right. Let us let's continue uh, to the next slide on collection. Uh, what we have here is, is our general rules for collecting wild seed of all all types uh, with tree seed. And many of you are familiar with these notions that these ideas or these uh, concepts that. Uh, you should ask permission from private landowners, and that that applies to uh, to every kind of seed collection. If you're going to go on someone, it just applies to to the idea of uh, access to to places. You should get permission from people. Uh, uh, state parks and state forests, at least in Indiana, uh, you can collect. All manner of seed and, and a variety of other things, fruits, nuts, and berries, as are listed there. And this all applies to seeds and, and tree seeds and to oaks, to acorns. Um, so many of you probably are familiar with, with these general guidelines for wild seed collecting. Um, in the case of trees, very often uh, tree seed appears in places. It may be public, they may be private, but they are places where it's obvious that the tree, the seeds cannot grow into trees. Uh, the easiest places to gather tree seed are in city parks, college campuses, uh, other kinds of other kinds of campuses, uh, parking lots where where big trees hang over parking lots and sidewalks and streets uh, are, are all good places to gather tree seed because it falls there and it's easy to find. In the forest, you, uh, the, the seed is difficult to find. It falls, it's among the leaves and the sticks and you have to hunt for each seed. But very often with tree seed in uh, public urban places, you can sweep it up, rake it up, collect large amounts if you need to do so, and it's very easy to gather them. Also, especially in larger older city parks and on college campuses, uh, I, I, I live near the Indiana University campus, and I dare say that virtually all of the species of woody plants that are native to Indiana are found on the campus and easy, uh, it's easy to gather their seeds. Uh, let us uh, let us continue. Oh well, a couple of books here in the upper left of the oh. screen. So, so Ray. Yes. So, uh, a quick question, Ray. Please, please. A quick go question. Ahead. Sorry. Uh, no, no. So, would you agree that you're collecting? Would you agree? Would you agree when you are collecting seeds that you should look for the healthiest tree of its species? Uh, to collect your acorns, or your, um, it, uh, or does it matter. Yes, it does matter. Uh, sometimes that's not an easy thing to judge. Um, if it if it can be seen here, here is an acorn from the gigantic bur oak that sits right up in front of the the uh, university, the student union building on Seventh Street in Bloomington. It's a spectacular tree. I, I would recommend go to that tree and collect your bur oak acorns. The, 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 the size of the acorn here reflects the, the, the immensity of that tree. That, the, the trees that are historic trees, perhaps, or obvious giants that are truly healthy, those are good trees to collect seed from. Uh, 
it doesn't mean that all the seed you collect from that tree can become a giant or a tree of great vigor, but uh, it's a sign, it's a sign. So uh, yes, look for, look for, uh, for large healthy trees, that's, that's a good idea. Um, um, I might add to that that uh, um, that's not always an easy thing to judge. Sometimes uh, trees that have grown under difficult circumstances might be genetically better than they appear to be. Also, a matter of sourcing your seed locally begins to, to uh, have an effect. Prior to the mid 70s, most nursery stock uh, for shade trees, for urban trees, was grown locally. Um, in the 70s, it became customary for a lot of stuff to, in a sense, uh, be imported or grown at, uh, at a distance that you might not consider to be local. In Southern Indiana, a lot of commercial nursery stock for the native trees comes from East Tennessee, a slightly different climate. So genetically, the younger trees that you see may or may not be as suitable for our climate as local trees. So bigger, older, healthy trees that produce vigorous acorns are certainly a good thing to look for. Is that a fairly complete answer? Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, good. Um, yes. So uh, the, 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 for, the USDA Forest Service Woody Plant Seed Manual uh, in the upper left of your screen. Uh, this is... Uh, this is the cover we're looking at is the 1948 edition in even at that time this this manual uh is the definitive uh, work on finding collecting storing stratifying and growing tree seed uh, in the united states and all the territories so this covers i think 400 in 50 species of, of trees and uh, the oaks, the oaks get seven or eight, nine pages of, of information here. And it, and it, it's very thorough. And of course, this has been updated, has been uh, updated, has been uh, 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 had new additions uh, up until maybe 2008, I think it's available online. You can, find the USDA Forest Service Woody Plant Seed Manual online. Paper copies of it can also be bought. And there in the middle is a field guide to the native oaks of Eastern North America. Uh, it, uh, it's a splendid book. And this is, this is trees east of, of the 100th parallel. So this would be Central Texas and Oklahoma eastward. And it's, it's, uh, it's pretty complete and it has clear descriptions of each of the species and clear keys in the back to identification of species, both through leaves in the summer and there are winter keys that describe the acorns and uh, the, the buds. And I believe there's a key to the bark patterns too, but in the winter, uh, the buds are always on the twigs of the trees. And if you really want to learn to identify the oaks, learning the buds and learning the acorns is by far the, the best way because you can see them all the time. A friend of mine who is a forester says that identifying trees is much easier in the winter when those pesky leaves are out of the way. And there's a great deal of truth to that. So both of these guides, uh, and of course I can, uh, as, as good background uh, material, uh, uh, Dr. Ptolemy's book, The Nature of Oaks, Oaks is certainly worth reading. 
uh, uh, Harlow and Harar, the field guide or the uh, the textbook of dendrology, and the USDA Forest Service uh, uh, Silvics and Silviculture Manual. Uh, I think it's publication new, number two hundred and seventy two are also worth having if you really if you really want to learn to grow oaks. Uh, so there's a bit about, about the specifics of gathering tree seed in general and oaks specifically. Go out now to city parks, especially the older parks, and to college campuses and other places where, where, uh, where not only uh, great varieties of trees are planted, but the seed is easy to gather. I saw the next screen and that would be perfectly good if we will. Okay, so now we'll talk a bit about uh, gathering acorns. Uh, the little rotary rake that you see here is called a, a pecan roller or sometimes called a nut weasel. And if you're gathering large amounts of seed, uh, it's really, they're really worth having. There are, they come in various sizes. There are more elaborate ones. There are even uh, gasoline and electric powered ones that, that look essentially like a lawnmower and you can roll up bushels of, of nuts at one time. And of course, you can simply gather if you're growing small quantities, uh, and most of you probably are, you can simply gather nuts off the ground under trees. Uh, if you look at the curb there, oftentimes you will find that nuts have rolled into the gutter or the curb of the street. And there are times when you can uh, gather them with a shovel or with a broom and a dustpan. I have occasionally found uh, large amounts of acorns uh, where I've shoveled up a five gallon bucket of acorns in, in two or three minutes uh, where the, the nuts fall off the tree, roll into the gutter in the water, the rain washes them into the gutter, especially at the at the drains where where uh, where the thing is where they uh, where the storm sewers drain sometimes they will clog such things up and so do remember uh, when you're gathering seed from these kinds of places that that seed is trash to the guy who cleans the street or who mows the lawn or who uh, has to keep the storm sewer uh, grace open. Uh, he's happy for you to take those seeds. He wants you to take as many as you want. Um, remember that viability in almost all the tree seeds and much wild seed is, is often highly variable and often in many trees pretty low. So if you want to grow one tree, gather a bunch of seeds. You know, I would say uh, gather 15, 20 seeds if to grow a tree and uh, and grow lots of seedlings because your goal is not to protect each seedling. Your goal for the spot in your yard that you want the tree to grow is to be certain that you produce a seedling in that spot. Uh, it's better uh, to have a whole bunch of them come up and have to thin them out than to go to the trouble of preparing a site, plant one acorn and it fails and you don't have a tree at all. Um, so be generous in gathering, but at the same time, uh, don't gather far more than you intend to use. Uh, so shovels, rakes, picking them by hand, brooms sometimes. Uh, we can talk about gathering them from the tree, and I might talk a little bit more about that shortly. But uh, here's, here's a saying that that holds pretty true uh, and that is that ripe seed seeds and unripe holds tight in other words if you can reach the branches if you take a hold of an acorn and it gives up easily and falls into the palm of your hand that seed is ripe. if you have to tug on that seed and pull hard it may not be mature yet it would be better to leave it on the tree. Now you've got uh, two problems to face. One, you want the seeds 
you want mature seeds that, that are viable, but you also have to get that seed before the squirrel or the deer do. So knowing that little uh, maxim there, uh, ripe seed seeds, unripe holds tight, means that if you take a hold of the seed and it gives up easy, then it's ready to grow. By the same principle, you can uh, shake the branches and the seeds that fall easily are the ones that you know are ripe or on higher branches. And we do this occasionally. You can, you can strike the branch with a stick or use say a, a pruning saw or a pruning hook. If you, uh, I've got a pruning hook that's 18 feet long, so you can reach pretty high branches. You get a hold of the branch, give it a shake. The acorns that are ripe fall, you pick them up. Uh, uh, with smaller kinds of seed, often in that kind of harvesting, you would spread a tarp on the ground, shake the branches, and the seeds fall into the tarp. Uh, and that can be useful if you have very heavy crops of acorns. Uh, uh, if you know that there's a lot of acorns hanging in the tree, uh, spread a tarp on the ground. And if you can reach a lot of the branches, and this is why you want to gather seed in uh, another reason you want to gather seed in city parks and college campuses and so forth is open grown trees produce far more seed than forest trees. And very often they're, relatively short, wide spreading, and the branches are uh, closer to the ground, and it makes easier, it makes it easier to harvest at least some of the seed directly from the tree. Uh, fallen seed should be um, uh, gathered as soon as possible when it falls. Here in Bloomington, with our immense population of deer, and squirrels, uh, the best time of day to gather seeds on the city streets or in the campus uh, is four or five o'clock in the afternoon because by tomorrow morning, the deer and the squirrels will have cleaned up everything. Uh, in more rural places, uh, it, it may be easier to gather large quantities, but here you have to time it. It's late in the afternoon because the deer come out in the evening and they eat acorns all night long and in the morning they're all gone. Let's look at the next slide if we will. So sorting and grading acorns. The first the first picture of the little tap hammer and it's just a street curb there shows that I have taken a number of acorns and simply hit them with a hammer and open them. Uh, viability in tree seeds varies greatly and you don't want to spend a lot of time gathering a whole lot of seed from a tree and find that, that none of them that were viable, that they were all hollow or they all were defective. And so since you have under a tree where large numbers have fallen, you got a lot of seed there, you can do a field test. And this falls under the category of a sacrificial um, a sacrificial test. We're gonna sacrifice a sample of the whole lot of acorns, all the acorns on that tree. We're gonna open them up and we're gonna have an estimate of the uh, the germination potential of the acorns on that tree. So this, this screen is a little small, but we see that I cracked a bunch of them open, 10 or 12, and it appears that they're all sound. So we might uh, infer from that, that all the acorns under that tree that have fallen, or virtually all of them will be sound and they're mature and they will grow. Uh, if we crack a bunch of them and we find that most of them are hollow, probably one of, unless it's a species or an individual that, that we want acorns from that particular individual tree, uh, we would be better to go find a tree with a higher percentage of sound nuts. 
So this sacrificial cut test, it would be called in a laboratory or a field test, gives us an estimate of the germination potential of the seeds on the individual trees. And that can vary greatly. Two trees of the same species right next to each other uh, can, can, one of them can have virtually 100% sound seeds and the, the one right next to it of the same species can produce uh, almost all, uh, all defective seeds. So this is a good estimate. Now, the next photo, floaters fail and sinkers succeed. This is called the float test. And the float test confuses some people. Uh, but uh, another saying that I don't have here, but it's worth knowing is that uh, viable seed sinks and uh, uh, oh, now I've lost the rhyme. But anyway, viable seed sinks. The seed that can grow sinks to the bottom and, and the floaters fails. Viable seed sinks, floaters fail. The seeds that have floated at the top are either damaged or hollow. Uh, uh, maybe they've been uh, 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 infested with either the uh, the long snout uh, acorn weevil, or there are a, a number of species of moths that infest them. And the ones that sink generally will be sound. Now, so in the the, the sinkers always in every case in spite of this field test or anything else you can do the sinkers always have a much higher viability potential than the floaters to the point where if you're doing a commercial nursery and you've got to you've got bushels and acorns to sort out you just take all the floaters and discard them because their germination potential will be far lower uh, than the sinkers so now we let us let us take our sinkers and look at them. We can do an ocular examination. I don't know how well this shows on your screen. The acorn on the extreme left has a tiny little hole in the top, and that's the hole that the uh, that the there are two acorn weevils. I think one is the long snout acorn weevil, and the other one might be the short snouted chestnut weevil. I believe that's correct. I'm I'm not an entomologist, but uh, the chestnut weevil also infects oak. So if you see little holes in the nut, even if it passed the the sink the float test and hit sank, discard it. Uh, if you see discoloration in the in the cap scar or it's sunk in, uh, and often the nut is pale brownish gray. Uh, in any species, that often indicates a bad one. If you see cracks in in the shell of the nut, of course, uh, that that indicates damage simply from falling on the tree, or maybe if you're gathering them from street sides, they got run over by a car, or stepped on. Uh, this the the color of healthy acorns varies by species. Generally speaking. They are browns and dark colors and stripes, and uh, and they're usually waxy and shiny looking. If a nut has this gray or brown, more uh, dull color, shrunken looking, that's often a bad one. Uh, the 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 bundle scar at the end that's underneath the cap should usually be flat or slightly uh, convex at the top, slightly upward. If it's caved inward, that often indicates a bad, a bad seed. And, and finally then, the cut test. And the cut test is much the same as the field test. Uh, I've, I've, I've got these, uh, my nuts home, and I want a more refined estimate of the germination potential, How, what percentage of them are sound. So here I've done a careful cut test of 20. 18 of them have nice cream-colored embryos inside. The colleague is firm, 
and and fleshy it's not mushy or soft not turn black or or brown or dark stripes in it and by contrast here's one we see that's obviously infected with uh the snout weevil and here's another one that is partly infected you want to reject those but this again gives you an estimate of the viability of your seed if you're if you're in if you're going to nursery uh this is extraordinarily important because uh, you don't want to grow empty pots or empty containers or a nursery bed of seedlings that is understocked and doesn't have as many seedlings in it as it should have. And for field planting, this is also important. So let us assume that we want to grow a shade tree in our front yard and uh, we want to be sure we get a seedling. If we have this high 90%, we might get away with just planting one nut, but they're free, they're easy to gather, uh, they're easy to plant, and we'll get to this in a minute. Put a bunch of them in the hole. Guarantee that you don't get a failure. Uh, and if you get a half a dozen seedlings, uh, remember what your goal is. Your goal is to produce at least one tree uh, in in uh, each planting site. And I know this is hard for some people, but in that case, the right thing to do is in the course of the first couple of years, you're going to choose the keeper and you're going to cut the rest of them down. And the logic is uh, transplanting is hard work, it's expensive, you could be doing other things, and the seed costs nothing. You're gonna prepare the number of planting sites that you want anyhow, so prepare your planting sites and put a bunch of these free seeds in each planting site and guarantee that, uh, that you get a tree in each planting site. And if you put eight or 10 seeds in each hole, they're not wasted. Remember that in nature, uh, a success rate of 1% of all the acorns that fall would be outrageous. It would produce a forest so dense that, that you couldn't possibly push your way through it. Nature's job is not to make sure that every acorn succeeds and grows into a tree. Nature's job is to feed all the creatures the snout weevil, the moth, the chipmunk and the squirrel and the deer, uh, and the forest is simply those few seeds that escape predation. Um, so if, if uh, a forest of oaks, and this can happen, can produce a million seeds in a year, a, a mature forest of oaks might produce many hundreds of thousands to a million seeds per year. If a few thousand per acre succeed, that's plenty. The rest of them are food for the creatures. Uh, so if you put a lot of oaks, acorns in the hole, they're not wasted. So these are, these are ways of assessing the quality of the acorns. Go ahead, if you will. Hey, Ray, just to give you a time check, uh, it's less than 20 minutes to the top oh, of the hour. Okay, go right ahead. Next screen. Okay, stratification. Stratification is the overwintering of a dormant seed artificially in the absence of rodents or predation. Uh, and we're, here, here is how this can be done with larger amounts of acorns outdoors. I have a wooden box here with half inch hardware screen. Uh, it's hard to see here, but this is sits in the bottom of a, a shallow hole that's maybe eight inches deep. You want to put this on well-drained soil. You don't want the acorns to, to be saturated with water, but you want them to stay moist. We add a layer of acorns. We cover it with loose sand or garden soil or leaf mold. If the box is a little deeper, we can repeat this two or three times and have several layers. We seal the box with another layer of a hardware cloth, and this can be uh, this can be an actual lid that you screw on, or you could weight the corners 
with bricks or stones, uh, any way to keep the rodents, the mice and the squirrels from digging in the box. You cover it with three or four inches of loose soil and straw. This should be placed in a shady place behind the shed, behind a barn or out, out of the sun. And this is how you stratify uh, acorns. Uh, many seeds, including the red oak acorns, require a long period of cold, moist conditions, essentially winter time, and a physiological change happens within that seed. And until that change happens, the seed remains dormant. But when that process does happen, then the seed is ready to grow. And usually that's three or four months, the length of a winter. If you do this matter of outdoor stratification, make sure that when you get into middle of February, you open this up and begin to check them on a regular basis because when that period of stratification is, is complete, uh, the, your acorns, the red oak acorns, the ones in the red oak group, will begin to germinate and they don't care how cold it is, uh, it's time. So they don't wait for nice, pleasant weather like corn or soybeans. They germinate when the process of stratification has been completed. Uh, so at that point, even if it's mid-February, you got to get them out of the ground and it's time to plant them. This can be done in the refrigerator with uh, plastic uh, sandwich bags or with the little plastic strawberry boxes or other containers that are vent that are have drainage and vented, and you can you can mimic this process of winter in your refrigerator for small amounts. Please go ahead. There may be lots of questions about that, and we'll talk about it. Go ahead to the next one, if we will. Okay, now this title using the drosty can, but this is here. Here is here is our method for sowing white oak acorns in the fall, site preparation. This isn't the best photo perhaps, but here, here what, what was done was the ground here was covered, I think in this case, with a big piece of cardboard and then a bunch of grass clippings were piled on it. And that was done in the summertime. And by October, when it was time to plant, uh, the sod had been smothered and we have a nice, mellow seed bed here so you see that no hole had to be dug or no you didn't have to cut any sod or spade anything you've you smothered this with a mulch it's the same processes that people do in preparing flower beds only a smaller a smaller area so generously right uh I should have put a one with eight or 10 seeds, but so generously, your goal is to guarantee that you get a tree here. The seed is free, easy to gather, put a lot of seed in there. If you get several seedlings, it's okay. This is called a drosty can, and a drosty can is an ordinary tin can. You burn it in a fire, and when you do so, uh, the protective coating is burned off the can and tin cans without the protective coating will rust away um, in about a year's time. Now, we, we don't have everything we should see. I, I did, may not have chosen my uh, photo carefully, but this, so this can has been burned in a fire. You see it's beginning to rust. The top of the can has two or three half inch holes punched in it. I just took a piece of rebar and a four pound hammer and, and punched holes in the top of that can. Uh, we, we've had to limit our photographs in, in number here. So what you can do is put this can over the three nuts. I put three in there. Remember, we wanna make sure we get one. All we need to do is succeed one time. This can is placed over the nuts and you drive it into the ground with a hammer and drive it all the way down. This makes it impossible for squirrels and chipmunks to dig it up. It makes it extraordinarily difficult for raccoons to dig it up. I suppose bears can dig them out. Uh, deer can't get at them. And we see here the top of the can 
driven in and soil secured around it. Sometimes if you need to, you can make a, a big staple out of a, a coat hanger. Drive this in here and in the spring, and we have a photo of this somewhere else in this presentation, the seedlings will come up through that opening. It's a half inch opening. Uh, this can by this same October next year will have rusted away to where it's just a, a bunch of rusty flaky corrosion. And if it hasn't, you can take a pair of pliers and open the thing up a little bit and it will rush away. This protects the acorn from the squirrel. He can't, the squirrel doesn't want the seedling. When he cuts your oak seedlings down in the summertime, he wants the acorn. He'll dig out the acorn, throw the seedling away and eat the acorn. This can, this can protect that acorn through the course of the first summer. By the end of the first summer, that acorn is absorbed into the roots and the shoot of the tree. And finally, uh, and those of you who live in urban places know that you got to protect planting sites of all trees and many other plants with cages. Let's go ahead. Here is the iron squirrel. And uh, this is a device for putting a lot of seeds in the ground fast without wearing your back out. The iron, the, the, uh, the orange part is called an ost planting bar. And it's a, it's a tree planting spade. It's made for planting uh, spruce and pine seedlings and nursery stock spruce and pine seedlings are just kind of like a pencil. They're brown on the bottom with a root and a little green on the top. Uh, you punch a hole in the ground with the bar and uh, put the seedling in. But you can take a tube of a vacuum cleaner, tape it to the handle of this thing, leave about two inches at the bottom. You push this in with your foot. You see it's got a foot, foot bar there and uh, work it forward and backward. Drop the acorn in the tube. The acorn falls into the hole. Here we see putting the acorn in. Here we see this way, I guess. And here we see that it has fallen into the hole. Uh, if the acorn isn't in there deep enough, you can gently tap it a little deeper with the tip of the spade, or you can push it in with the heel of your boot. And then you take your boot heel and you press it closed. And when you do this, you want this site to virtually be invisible. Uh, of course, squirrels can smell acorns in the ground, but they also hunt visually. And when they see disturbed soil where other squirrels or where blue jays have buried nuts, uh, they explore those places. So you, you make a little slot and put the acorn in and press the soil closed around it. The roots of acorns are extraordinarily strong. You don't have to prepare a loose seed bed for an acorn. It will it'll come out and, and put a root down a foot deep into the ground in the winter through, through the nastiest kind of clay. So there's the iron squirrel. You can, of course, also plant this way with a simple garden spade uh, and, and bend over and put the nuts in. So this is, this is for larger reforestation. If you want to grow a small forest, which seems to be all the rage these days, or you've got a field that you want to plant, uh, you, can, you, can put, you can put many hundred to a thousand acorns in the ground in a day. Please continue. Okay, we talked about the Drosty can. Here's, here's one in action. Now, this one, I think the person who sent me this photo might have got lucky because it's a pretty big hole, but no matter, we see a little oak has come up through this and the squirrel has a hard time getting in there. Uh, you can use these to great effect, just in ordinary tin cans, and, uh, and it's, it, will, it, will, it will rust away in time. And of course, if it doesn't rust quickly enough to suit you, take a pair of wire cutters and open this metal up. Fencing is important. We all know that. Uh, anyone who is urban here, at least, and I certainly am now, uh, Bloomington is a shock. I've never, I've spent 50 years in the woods and I've seen more deer dead and alive here in the last 10 months than I saw in my whole life working. The dead hedge, if you're removing invasive plants, 
You can use the dead brush to protect oak saplings. Here we see a little oak sapling in a fairly neatly made hedge. It's simply a hollow pile of brush. You can, you can make things like this and plant acorns inside them. And here is the use of uh, regular hall wire, which is way too big an opening, the uh, agricultural fence combined with uh, uh, honeysuckle branches. And you can see that there's a little uh, persimmon seedling in this case down in there, and he's doing just fine. You can tie brush around uh, any kind of fencing to, to improve the cage and to give added protection. Uh, use your imagination in protecting seedlings if you have deer and rabbits. There are, there are many ways to do that uh, using both fencing and uh, found materials. Please go ahead. Yes, me to give you a heads up at uh, uh, 10 till. It's about uh, six till. Oh my, okay. Well, here's a planning project. You know, perhaps I can take questions about it. This planning project was done in 2011. Here we see that we have a bunch of seedlings in the hole. I, you, I followed my own advice and we got plenty. Here's a row of them at year one and it's, it's a, a bunch of these little thickets of seedlings. Here's one at year one, given good care. Um, here they are year four and here's one of those trees 22 years later. Uh, and uh, there's a, this is a planning project in Ferdinand, Indiana in 18th street park. And there are 60 of these. And uh, they were planted by an agricultural uh, school agricultural class and all we used was two or three garden hose and a bucket of acorns and there were 60 of them and now they've got a half mile uh, a row of trees along a walking path there that costs nothing and in uh, in in the year they were planted we had an estimate made and it would have cost us seventy five hundred dollars to have them planted then it would cost a lot more now so this direct seeding idea can be applied on a larger scale. Okay, go ahead. We should go to the questions. I hope there are. Go ahead, Deb. Hi, Ray. Uh, very good. Thanks so much for your presentation. Lots of great information. Uh, so we have uh, uh, several questions. So um, you talked about the root grows down below that first year and we don't even know it. So the question from uh, one of our uh, listeners is, so planting in the ground in cage is better than trying to pop them. I believe uh, so. Oh, okay. Go right. Ahead. All right. Um, yeah. Because of Finish that. The question. Um, what about transplanting and then caging around versus planting them in? So you're, wow. would you, you basically talked about that, but it doesn't sound like transplanting any of those that you've started in the ground is ideal. Everything I showed you there was so directly in the soil. Here's, here's the, here are the advantages as I see it. Um, the seed costs nothing. The seed is easy to gather. Preparing the seed that the planting sites is easy. That is to say, all I did was uh, pile a pile, a, it, it, or you can do it different ways, but pile grass clippings out of your lawnmower in the place where you want the tree to grow. Do that in June in, in uh, pile the grass clippings there. And by October, when the seeds are ready, you have a, you have no sod to deal with. You pull that mulch back. You have a mellow seed bed. You have no hole to dig whatsoever you scrape back a couple inches of soil and stick the acorn in, and then you protect the acorn. Uh, that first winter in the, in the white oaks we're talking about now, that acorn produces this great long tap root. If we plant, if we protected it with the drosty can, or you can also use hardware cloth cages, I'm sure you can imagine how they would be done. Uh, so you've done no work and you don't have to do any work. The acorn's in the ground where it's gonna grow for the next 500 years. And uh, it's safe under the can and you don't have to store it. And uh, you don't have 
to take care of little plants that are in pots. It never needs watering, ever. You'll never have to water it, uh, save a terrible drought. Now, to, to keep it alive, you can water and fertilize trees to make them grow faster, but direct seeded trees never have to be watered. Uh, there's no big, there's no nursery at all. The nursery doesn't exist. You don't have little trees in rows in a bed or a bunch of pots that you got to water all summer and weed. Uh, none of the nursery disappears entirely. Uh, trees that are grown directly in place outgrow every kind of transplant on an annual basis. When you go to the nursery and spend $300 for an inch and a half caliper oak tree and bring it home, many of you know this saying that the, uh, the, the, the first year it sleeps, the second year it creeps, and the third year it leaps. Drexone trees never sleep and they never creep. They grow the way they're supposed to from the very beginning. They cost nothing. You have not dug any holes at all. And they will, the, unlike transplants, they won't have to be watered ever and they'll never need to be staked. Uh, in, in modern conditions where we all are plagued with deer, um, you have to build fences anyhow. You're, so your $300 transplant if you don't build a fence, the buck deer is going to come skin the bark off of it anyhow. So you got to build a fence. So the fence, the fence doesn't count because both the direct sown tree has to be fenced and the nursery stock that you spent $300 for and hauled it home in the truck and dug a great big hole. And then you have to water it and stake it afterwards. The deer's going to get that one too, but they both have to have fences. So that's, that's my complete logic for growing trees in place from seed. We have inventories of two groups of trees down in Ferdinand uh, of oaks and the transplants, the, the, the direct seeded oaks on an annual basis grow 30% faster, both in height and diameter. Now you got to allow that the nursery stock was already five years old when we got hold of it, and we spent at that time one hundred and thirty three dollars a piece on them. And and the direct seeded ones cost us nothing, and they're almost now uh, this many years later they're all the same size. Right. And right. our and our direct seeded so, so, a sign of growing faster than the transplants. Yes. Right. So you of, have you you have very long responses. It's, that's I great. But we, have a lot, we have a lot of questions, and we are Let's at go. the top of the hour. So yeah. I'll I'll try to throw a couple in there and and try to answer them as quickly as possible. Yes. So uh, I'm going to kind of skip around. Is it reasonable to try to grow oaks in the middle of the woods where there are beech being decimated by the beech leaf disease, and they are in no. mass? No, not until the not until the beaches all die and there's plenty of light. Uh, uh, most of the oaks are pretty intolerant of shade, and none of them are tolerant enough to grow in the shade of mature forests. They might they might sprout, but they won't. They can't mm -hmm. uh, achieve maturity. They they need light. Oak is not the choice for that. Are we frozen? Maybe she is. Oh dear. Okay. <laughs> Do you have access uh, to the... go ahead, Bill. Let's see. Uh let me uh Okay, we've already answered that. I should have been following along. Uh we have a seven acres uh is. in okay, there she is. Are you ready? I'm ready. Uh we have seven acres of forest. Uh, in Allen County, looking for best way to spread out new growth. Uh, seven acres. Okay. Well, uh, everything depends upon the the condition and the composition of that forest, and so it's very difficult to to give advice with without knowing a good bit more about it. Uh, you have a district forester 
and he's worth consulting the, the the DNR district forester. I don't know your forester up there, but uh, district foresters will come to your place, have a look at it, help you meet your goals. And they're worth right. their work. And so there are also private consulting foresters that do the same work. There was an early question, Ray. Yes. Um, about are all oaks either considered red or white? No, no, there are three or perhaps two other subgenera that uh, don't occur in, well, let's see. Well, one or two of them occurs in the Western United States and the live oaks, if you're familiar with those, are in yet another subgenus, but the live oaks for propagation purposes behave the way the white oaks do. So that, those are botanical uh, uh, differences. So there are, there are five, uh, unless the, the botanists are often rechange things. There's five subspecies, subgenera of oaks in the world, but those two groups that I named are the ones that are common in the Eastern US. Cool. Uh, this wasn't a question on the chat, uh, so it probably tells you it's mine. That's fine. Um, <laughs> uh, so would you use the same process for other types of um, uh, tree seeds, such as uh, hickory, because you have the same type of, they're not, I don't know if they're acorns, but type of seed. Would you use that same process? I certainly okay. would. I could have done this whole program on hickories and it would be very much, very similar. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, virtually anything can be grown cheaply and easily, which is the whole point of my thing, to help people grow them without spending money and to do without without hard work. That's okay. and, uh, Virtually everything can be grown that way. All right. I think we have uh, exceeded our time and uh, I, that, I think we have all the questions answered. Um, so I'm going to bring Bill back in to uh, wrap up. Thanks again, Ray. Thank you, folks. It was a pleasure. I hope this has been helpful. Well, thanks, Ray. Um, I've I've heard your presentations a few times, and I, I always learn new things. And I, I do appreciate it very much that you joined us tonight. But we'll go ahead and wrap up the meeting now. But if you have any additional questions regarding the presentation or native seed communities, feel free to reach out at the links that uh, Deb has provided. Also, we invite you to join our Facebook group, uh, Indiana Native Native Seed Communities. Um, pictures and videos of your uh, growing oaks are uh, quite welcome. Uh, also, as our pattern has been, we will have another presentation uh, in October, October the 24th, that's a Tuesday, and we'll be having Cody Huff from Wellfield Botanic Gardens in Elkhart, Indiana, speak to us. Uh, hope to see many of you there. Thanks again, Ray, for the informative session. Also, I'd like to thank Deb Hausen, Deb, uh, for helping with the questions and the behind the scenes needs and, uh, and being my technical backup tonight. Uh, anyway, it was good to see you all. Uh, we'll sign off now and happy growing natives from seed. Bye-bye all.